Somebody's going to hear, well done, and some are going to hear, wicked and lazy. So today we're going to be talking about in Matthew 25, and the title of the message today is Well Done. Matthew 25, verse 14, all the way to verse 30. This is a parable that Jesus spoke, and he said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents. Now a talent is like a coin, money. To another he gave two, to another he gave one each according to their own ability, and he immediately went on a journey. Then he, then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord whose servants came of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he gave them all some money. He left and he came back. So verse 20, he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, five more saying, the Lord, look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received the two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents and look, I've gained two more besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter to the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. And look, there you have what is yours. He just brought the one back. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you have ought to deposit my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he who will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that's kind of a strong story Jesus is telling us about the kingdom of heaven, and he identifies three different servants. And the two first servants were considered faithful servants because they went out and did something with what the Lord had given them and brought back not only what he'd given them, but more. And he said to those two servants, the first ones, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. And that's the title of the message today is Well Done. How many people here would like to hear those words someday? Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. I don't know if I've ever talked to a Christian who, who said, I don't want to hear those words. <laughs> okay. You'd be kind of foolish not to hear those words because um, they're coupled with another phrase, a couple phrases. He said, I will make you rule over much. Well, a lot of us don't care too much about that. But we do care about that other second phrase where he said, enter into the joy of the Lord, <laughs> right? Because you cu couple that with the foolish servant who was cast out into outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. We don't want that. We want a, the part of entering into the joy of the Lord, entering to the presence of the Lord, entering into the kingdom of heaven and being in heaven with the Lord. So definitely we want to hear those words well done because they are equated with and coupled with coming into the presence of the Lord. So the Lord has gone on this far journey. He sat down at the right hand of the Father, and He's going to reckon with us one day everything He's given us. And we've got to present to Him, here's what you gave me, and here's what I have uh, made out of it. What you've given me, this is what I've done with it, and I'm bringing this back to you. And so we want to hear those words, well done. And that's the only two words I'm preaching on today, is well done. 
Well done. But I, as I was reading this again this morning, <clears throat> uh, I noticed that there were two other words that I could have preached on for the servant who got the one talent and dug it. And that was in verse 26. But the Lord answered to him and said, you wicked and lazy. So there's your contrast there. Somebody's going to hear, well done. And by the way, it says uh, in verse 14, it's like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants. So we're not talking about the unsaved. We're not talking about people who don't know the Lord. We're talking about people who belong to the Lord, that we are His. So of those groups, some are going to hear, uh, well done. Some are going to hear, wicked and lazy. And you say, well, how could that be? Well, you just got to read Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, I think it is, where Jesus says, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and done all these things? He said, I never knew you. So there's a, there's a lot of people out there who are calling the name of the Lord, call themselves by the name of the Lord, but they will fall into this third category of wicked and lazy. That's two things I don't want to be. I don't want to be wicked and I don't want to be lazy. Amen? Either one is, is a bad thing. So I want to look at, just quickly today at those two words that we all long to hear, and that is well done. So when you think of the phrase well done, to hear those words spoken to you, there's three things that have to be possible. They have to have happened, okay, to hear well done. First of all, to hear well done, you must have done something. Okay? I mean, this is a pretty simple message today, but it's pretty deep as well. You must have done something. The scripture said that Jesus gave each one of those servants something to work with. He gave them some tools. He gave them in this illustration just coins, but He's given everybody something to work with. So you're supposed to do something with what He has given you. Whatever it is. And I, and I like it is it says, each according to their own ability. So that means we all didn't get the same thing. As we see from the story, some got five, some got two, some got one. We're all given something according to our... See, God knows when He made us when He formed us in the womb, when He called us to be whatever He's called us to be, He knew how He made us. He knew what we would like. and what, See, people are sometimes don't understand God. Well, God will send you someplace where you don't want to go. Well, why would He do that? Why would God call you to be a missionary and then send you to someplace you don't want to go? Why would He do that? Because you're not going to be happy there. You're not going to want to be there. You're going to be looking for excuses to, to get away from there. God knows who you are. He knows what you're able to do, what you're capable of doing. So that's what He's going to call you to do. He's not going to call an electrician to go do plumbing work or vice versa. You call an electrician to go do electrical work, right? God's going to make you a certain way and then He's going to call you to do something that fits the parameters of who you are, who He made you to be, according to your own individual ability, okay? So He's not going to ask you to do something that you cannot do. Because He's going to give you the ability and the tools to do everything He's called you to do. Amen. He, he, he may call you to go as far as you can go, and then He chips in supernatural ability to, to take you the rest of the way, but He's still going to make sure that you're able to accomplish it. So He gives you gifts, and the greater gifts He gives us, the more things He gives us, the more He expects out of us. Okay? And notice this, this illustration went from high to low. So no one can say, I don't have anything to offer. There's nothing I, no one can say, I can't do anything for the Lord. Because He gives us all according to our own ability. Even if you have very minimal ability of, of what you could do, that's all the Lord expects you to work with then. Amen? He, he didn't expect that one with the one talent to go out and make a million dollars with it. He just expected, well, the other guys doubled it. Couldn't you turn, you know, he turned five into ten, he turned two into four. Couldn't you turn one into two? Couldn't you at least put it in a bank and got some interest on it? I mean, come on, it's not that difficult. All you had to do is walk down to the bank, say, here, I'm depositing this, and, and leave it. Didn't have to do anything, hardly at all. And that was maybe his ability. Maybe his ability wasn't great in, in business like maybe these other ones were to go and, and double the money. But he was able to do something. 
But here's what I understand a lot of times is I hear a lot of people, a lot of people who call themselves Christians who say, oh, I want to hear the word, the Lord say, well done. Well, as I said, you can't hear the words well done unless you've done something. You can't just sit around and do nothing and then expect to hear well done. Something has to have been done to hear the words well done. Well, I just don't know what the Lord wants me to do. So I'll just sit here and do nothing. Well, first of all, if you sit there and do nothing your entire life for the Lord, you're not going to hear well done. You're going to hear, well, you did nothing. You're going to hear wicked and lazy. You should have got up and done something, but you didn't. He's not. I like this parable. The Lord's not even afraid that we're going to go lose what he gives us. You know? Uh, if you were to take money today and try to, to do something with it, you might take an adventure, a, a business adventure or a stock market or something. You might actually lose the money somebody gave you to invest. But the Lord doesn't even say, I, I'd be mad at you if you do that. He just wants us to do something. Because we he knows if we do something with what he's given us and we, we do it for him, it's going to prosper. He says, I'll bless everything you put your hand to. Everything you do, I'll make it to prosper. You'll have good success. So he knows that it's going to work. So you can't just say, well, I don't know what the Lord wants me to do, so I'm going to do nothing. Well, let me tell you, he gave us all eyeballs. And he gave us all ears. And all we've got to do is open our eyes and open our ears, and you can see lots of things that need to be done. Going on in this in this same chapter, of course, it's a long story, but we don't have time to read it. He goes on, talks about, you saw me hungry, and you gave me food. You saw me thirsty, and you gave me a drink. What was it? You felt led to do that? No, you saw it. You saw somebody who was hungry, and you fed them. You saw somebody who was thirsty, you gave them a drink. You saw somebody who was sick, and you visited them. You prayed with them. Saw somebody was in prison. You went and visited them. Whatever the case may be, you saw something. So don't say, I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. All he says, open your eyes. There are people all around you, all around you who are hurting. Physically, emotionally. I mean, you don't have to talk to somebody very long to find out. Listen, we live in a broken world, a fallen world, and everybody has gone through something. We've all gone through things, right? And thankfully, the Lord has touched us and helped us through things. He's healed our, our broken hearts. He's healed our sick bodies, whatever the case is. But other people may not know the Lord. And they haven't had the benefit of having the Lord help them through a situation. And here we are put on this earth to do that very thing. Just to help people. Just to open up our eyes and see. Just to open up our ears and hear. You don't have to talk to somebody very long. The, the greatest, greatest witnessing day of the week is Monday. Amen. Because all you got to do to say to somebody was, how was your weekend? Oh, let me tell you. I went to start the car and it wouldn't start. And then when it did start, I had a flat tire. And then I got sick. And then this happened and this happened. And there's your opportunity. If you were listening, all you got to do is say, well, you know, can I just... Can I just say a prayer with you right now that today will be better than the weekend was? There you go. There's an opportunity to do something. You say, that's not very much. Well, God's not asking you to do very much sometimes. Little by little, little by little, little by little adds up. You see, God has given us victory in what we're going to do. He's given us victory. We just got to go do it. Amen. He told them coming into the promised land, just go take the promised land. Just go possess it. Just, it's yours. I, I've, already, I've already given it to you. It's your, just go get it. But you see, some people didn't want to just go get it. <clears throat> you've, you've probably um, seen and heard of, uh, even in Paul's day, he talked, to, he talked about boxing. Uh, boxing matches where people fight in the ring, you know. And uh, there's lots of places, not just the, the Las Vegas that the ones you see on TV, but lots of places all the time where people are boxing and <clears throat> having fights and so on and so forth. And have you ever heard, <clears throat> excuse me, of a fight be being fixed? Of a fight being rigged? <clears throat> you know, you kind of hear, maybe see that, saw this in movies or something back in mafia days or something where they had this fight <clears throat> and because you know people are betting on the fight 
they want a certain person to lose. So they set it up, you know, hey, if, if you don't, if you don't lose or throw the fight, you know, we're going to, you know, break your kneecaps or something. I don't know. Anyway, throughout history, there have been some fights that have been rigged that before the fight ever began, you knew who was going to win. It was predetermined who would win the fight before the, any punches were ever thrown. But here's the thing. <clears throat> Even though the fight was rigged, the two boxers still had to show up. And they still had to fight, even though it was predetermined that one of them was going to win anyway. If it was rigged, okay, and the one who's, who was supposed to win, you know, hey, I'm going to win this fight. They've already told me I'm going to win this fight. If that person didn't show up to fight, they would forfeit. You see that? And here's the Lord with us. He says, I have predetermined that you're going to win. I have predetermined that you will win your fight. And because we've heard that, we decided not to show up. And by not showing up to a fight we've already won, we forfeit because we did nothing. He expects us to get into the ring and to fight and to work and to do whatever he's called us to do. He knows we're going to be successful. He knows we're going to win, but we still got to show up. We still got to get into the, into the game. We still got to get out and do some things. So the first thing we hear out of the words well done is you have to have done something. You must have, it must be something you were doing. The second thing is well done is not well doing. So done means you completed it. You completed what you were doing. You were doing something and you completed it. So it's done. It's well done. Done. All right. Uh, let's look here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Paul said these words about his life and his ministry and what he had been doing for the Lord and what the Lord had given him. He said, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul knew his time was near. I, I believe, I, you know, I've not preached on it before, but I've met a lot of people, known a lot of people, heard a lot of situations of believers who have known when the time was up. They knew their time was at hand. They knew it wasn't going to be long. Paul knew, probably by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that his time he said, I'm already being poured out like a drink, drink offering. He, he knew I'm just getting so close to, to leaving earth, to, to, to dying is what he's saying here. My departure. Uh, he's not talking about just going from one city to another. He's talking about going from earth to heaven. He says, and because I know I'm about to die and be poured out like a drink offering, I have fought the good fight. He said, I have finished the race. He didn't just say I ran it, but I finished it. Paul finished the race. See, running isn't enough. You have to finish the race. You can't say, good job finishing the race if you didn't finish the race. Right? You can't say, well done if whatever it is you were doing didn't get done. Okay? You know, if you're trying to make a cake and it's, it's in the bowl and it's in the batter and it's all stirred up, you can't say, hey, well done making that cake. It's not done yet. It's, it's unfinished. Paul said, I have finished. So we don't want to leave any, we don't want to leave anything on this earth that the Lord wants us to do unfinished. We don't want to say, leave it for somebody else and say, well, you know, I didn't get anything done for the Lord. So you, you can finish up what I left unfinished. We don't want to do that. We don't want to leave something for someone else to do. Uh, you got to finish the race. I remember running in high school. <clears throat> uh, boy, I hated running. I don't know. These people that get out and run, that run, like to you know, run five miles, they enjoy it. I don't know how God made them, but he didn't make me that way. Because I hated to run. I didn't mind if, if we were playing a game, if we were playing basketball or something. I could run up and down the court all day long. But just to get out and run, I hated it. But they made us run, and 
uh, you know, if you're going to be in this sport, you got to use run this track or cross country to get conditioning. So we would run and and I, I I ran the high hurdles. That was my the one I excelled in. It was only like 110 meters. It, it was over in 15 seconds. OK, I could tough that out for 15 seconds. But because we were a small school and there weren't that many, they say, well, you're going to not only run this, but we're going to have you run this and this and this or whatever. And so I ran all kinds of different races in, in the track meets. And sometimes they would say, hey, we're going to have you run the, the, the two mile. No, please don't. They'd make me run the two mile. And listen, I was terrible at long distance. I hated it with a passion. Just, I mean, the first, after the first 30 seconds, I'm ready to stop. I'm just, I'm tired. My, my stomach's hurting. My legs are hurting. I don't want to do this. But you had to finish. You had to finish. And so I would run <coughs> and people would, you know, they'd all take off. I'd like, go fine, go ahead. I'll you know, just truck in behind you here. And I'd be running and it's two miles. So that's like eight laps around a regular trap track. And, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but after a couple laps, I hear footsteps behind me. And it's the guy that's in first, <laughs> you know, like, oh, oh, well, I just scoot over to the side and let him go. And here comes the guy in second. And yeah, people lapped me. But I ran according to my own ability. See, the, the coach knew everybody had a different ability in different areas. And he knew if he put me in that, he knew. I, and now I, I might win, and I had one in the, in the hurdles, but he, know, he knew when he put me in a mile or two mile or something like that, he knew I wasn't going to win that for the gym. He knew my ability. He knew what I was capable, capable of, but you just had to finish. He just wanted me to finish. He didn't want me to give up, didn't want me to quit. I remember one day they took us out, and, and for practice, we're going to run um, what you call a country mile. Anybody know what a country, a country block is? A country block is like a mile this way, a mile this way, a mile this way, and a mile this way. So they dropped us off and said, you're going to run around the block, which a country block's four miles. So they dropped us off, and we ran. And we were all running, and again, I'm not at the top. I, I, I was always just begging somebody, hey, stay with me. You know, don't leave me out here by myself. Just slow, slow down and run with me. And so we try, I try to get somebody to you know, s- slow to. We just hang out and kind of talk and run. But we ran and jogged. As we were going around this country block, there was a railroad track that ran through it diagonally. Okay? And as we got to that first, you know, corner farthest away that's where that railroad track started and some of the people who were much faster than me they were the ones who actually went uh, won these long races they decided we'll cut through the railroad track and we'll shave off about half this by cutting through the railroad track well i don't know if i didn't think of it or uh they had already done it by the time i got there or what but i didn't do that me and the guys I was with, we didn't do that. We were the slow ones. And when we got to the railroad track, we just went on by it, and we went around the whole square and finished. Well, here's the, what these guys didn't realize. They weren't real smart. That if you're going to run a four miles, it should take you a, a certain amount of time to run four miles. And if you're going to cut that in half, you got to sit around for a while before you show up to the finish line. Because if you said, I ran a four-minute mile and I did it in five minutes, they're going to be a little suspicious because you're not going to accomplish it that fast. But they So they showed up way too soon. And the rest of us showed up at the time we were supposed to be like, you know, whoa, when, is Newton ever going to get here? What's taking him so long? We finally showed up. Well, it didn't take the coach. He wasn't a rocket scientist, but it didn't take him much to figure out. These guys cheated. And they cheated by cutting across, taking a shortcut, and they got in bad trouble. They got in bad trouble for doing that because they didn't finish the race. The coach could say to us, even those of us that were slow, he could say, well done. You did your best. It was slow, but it was your best. Your your best is slow. That's okay. Your best is slow. Well done because you completed the course. You did what you were supposed to do. And sometimes I think the church is looking for shortcuts. We want to look for excuses. Reasons why, and these same guys, they didn't learn. 
Uh, one other time we were doing the same thing. They'd driven us out of town and dropped us off five, six miles away and say, run back to the school. As we were running back, somebody's friend from school drove by. Hey, what are you guys doing? Hey, let me in. And those guys got in and drove back. They got really quick that time in a car. Coach figured it out again. Dumb. Trying to cheat. Trying to make it look like I did something when I didn't do something. Trying to make it look like I completed something when I didn't complete something. Now listen, if our coaches are smart enough to figure that out, don't you think the Lord is going to know when we say, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's all done over there, Lord. Yeah, we, that's finished. The Lord's going to know whether we did anything for Him or not. See, the job, Paul says, continues until we leave. Our job for the Lord, working for the Lord. See, in, in this parable, it, was, it wasn't until the servant and the masters got back together that things were reconciled. Right? Well, Paul says, my departure's at hand. He's about, he's about ready to go reconcile with the Lord. He's about ready to go give an account for everything he's done because he's leaving this place. So our job for the Lord does not stop until we leave planet Earth. There is no retirement for the Christian. We are a Christian until we leave this place. Amen? You better hope you are, right? I mean, that's, that's your ticket out of here is to be Christian. So you, 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 there, I mean, I joke around about retirement and not being able to retire or this or that, but let me tell you the truth, honest truth. You know, I would like to get a, be, get to a place where I'm not relying on a, on a paycheck as, as retirement, but I never want to quit working for the Lord. I mean, I, I hope that I'm, I hope I'm one of those 95, 99 year old preachers still preaching I don't think the Lord will wait that long to come back. But if he were to wait that long, that would be my desire, is to keep on keeping on all the things he's shared with me over the years, to keep preaching that, to keep sharing that. I don't want to retire from that. I want to keep going because I want to finish what he's called us to do. But you, like me, anytime we're doing something, we get wore out. And, and we, we know these scriptures, but there's two. I, you may not know there's two. Galatians 6, 9 and Thessalonians 3, 13, that say kind of similar things. Let's look here in Galatians 6, 9 first. Here's, here's when we're doing something, and, and you feel like not completing it, okay? Let's say you, you're running that two mile, and you feel like, oh, boy, if I just... And I used to think these kinds of things. They, they, they'd make us run cross-country. They'd take us to a golf course or some crazy place and run three-something miles or whatever. And I'd be running along thinking, oh... There's a Dairy Queen over there, you know. There's a, there's a pizza shop over there. And I could just veer off the course and nobody would ever know. And I'll somehow I'm just mosey. And you feel like giving up. But it says, let us not grow weary, Galatians 6, 9, while doing good. See, when we're doing something for the Lord, we're doing good. And we shouldn't be weary in doing that. 2 Thessalonians 3, 13 says the very similar thing, says, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. So there's two places here where the Bible says, don't get tired of doing the right thing. Don't get wore out. Because see, when we get wore out, it's a, it's a warning to us. I'm, I'm glad that it's in there because it lets us know, be, be on the lookout for wanting to give up. Be on guard because you're going to get tired. You're going to get weary. But don't let that be a thing that makes you want to quit. Don't let it stop you. Don't let it hinder you. You might be facing a task that seems insurmountable. You may be, you may see, uh, open up your eyes and see, oh, I see all these, these starving children around the world. And your heart breaks for them. And you say, oh, I just wish I could adopt them all. Wish I had the money to adopt them all and feed them all and give, you know, just make their bellies full and to give them all a hug. And and that you and you start thinking about that and you think, well, that's too much. I, I don't have the money, I don't have the resource. I couldn't do that. There's I couldn't do that at all. I mean, and you just think it's so insurmountable to reach that many children. But maybe God didn't call you to reach all those children. Maybe He's only given you the ability to reach one of them. Just one. 
according to our own ability. Maybe somebody with billions of dollars could reach millions of kids. Maybe you don't have billions of dollars to feed all those children, but maybe you have enough to feed one. As we do with our ministries here, we send our Christmas bags, but also throughout the year they're sending food and things and sandwiches and peanut butter and all, all those kinds of the peanut butter sandwich kits and all those things to, to people who need it. I mean, most of us don't even have any idea what it's like to be hungry. I mean, you know, when we fast, we know what it's like to be hungry, but in the back of our mind, we know our cabinet's still full of food. It's, that's one thing. To be hungry, but no, hmm, there's, a, there's a bowl of ice cream and a bag of chips and candy and chips and bread and meat. and I'm hungry, but there's food right there. It's a whole different thing to be hungry and there's no food anywhere. And you don't know when the next food's coming. That's a whole different thing. You might not be able to feed all those children, but you could feed one. And there's even hungry children here where we live. You don't have to go around the world. You don't have to send money to somebody else to do it. You could do it yourself. But the task may seem insurmountable. Maybe God's not calling you to complete the whole task. You know, you could move a whole mountain of dirt with just one shovel at a time. It'd take you a long time. It'd take a long time, but you could do it. One shovel at a time. You could do it. It'd take you a long time. But maybe God's not calling you to move the whole mountain. Maybe He's just calling you to move a little bit of it. So, well done. You have to have done something to hear those words. And there's a whole lot of people talking about, I can't wait to get to heaven. I just really want to hear the Lord say, well done. And they've not done a thing. And, and, and let me commend you, first of all, for being here at church today. Let me commend you for that. But, but I, I, I want to warn you, this is just like training. This isn't actually the doing. This is just the training. The doing's out there, okay? There's, I mean, there's people that won't even come here for the training. So they're not going to hear well done because they don't even come for the training to, to get trained to go do. That's what the ministry is for is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry so you can go do something with what the Lord's given you. Uh, this is just the training. But I do commend you because, listen, it, it's hard to go do something unless you've been equipped and trained and, and God has spoken to you and, and God stirs in you. Uh, but you got to do something and then you got to complete. So there's a lot of people sitting around doing nothing. They don't they only even come for the training sessions. All right? They don't even come for the training. Church, you know, and the reading the Word and hearing the Lord. They don't even come for that. And they think they're going to hear well done. No, you've got to do something to hear well done. Second of all, you've got to complete it to hear the word done. And lastly, well done is the well part. You did it well. You just, I mean, you could, how many ever done a bad job of something? Yeah. My, my mom, dad always, my mom was supposed to say, well, anything worth doing is worth doing right. Oh, they beat that into me. Anything, and I do that. I mean, if it calls for, you know, if it calls for, you know, this much steel, I'm going to use this much steel. You know, if it calls for, you know, 500 pound strength, I'm going to use a thousand pound strength. I, I, I overkill on a lot of things. And I, brother Jim, you're probably that way too. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure it's last. I'm going to make sure it's good. What anything's worth doing is worth doing right. Well done. Paul said he fought the good fight. So he says, I'm going to give you according to your ability. So therefore, all you've got to do is to your ability. You do the best with your ability. You, it's, don't compare you. Listen, if you've, if you've got two and you went out and gained two, don't compare yourself out to with the one who had five and gained five more. Don't Try not to compare. Because his ability, he got five. Your ability, you got two. It's just to your ability. Do your best. Let's try not to get this in this comparison game. And, and, I, and I, I despise this within, especially within denominations where they try to pit churches against one another and youth groups against one another. Hey, this youth group gave $5,000 to mission. Oh, this youth group gave $7,000. Hey, if you'll give $10,000, you will get your name on a plaque. And if you'll do this, you'll... that competition thing's not good. We're not in competition with one another. We're supposed to do 
what God called us to do, do it to the best of our ability so we'll hear, well done, whether that was a large thing or a small thing. If we did it, we'll both hear, well done. Amen. We'll both hear, well done. So don't compare yourself to others. Jesus gave us talents according to our ability. It always bothered me uh, when I was in art class or when my kids were in art class and the teacher, I mean, how many, how many of you can, can draw a circle? I mean, some, some, yeah, some of you are like, I'm not sure how good I can draw a circle. Some people are better at art than others, right? When it comes to drawing something, you draw, draw a face. You know, some people are just a circle with two dots and a smiling face, right? Some are like, oh, I got a shadow and this and that. And some people are good at it. They're able to have a lot of ability in art, right? Some people don't have a lot of ability in drawing or art. And it always bothered me, how does an art teacher grade that? Well, they're just, a lot of them just graded on, well, how good does it look? Well, that's not fair. Because you're talking about somebody who maybe has a lot of talent in art and someone has zero talent in art. And you say, well, they have a lot of talent, so they get an A because they did drew, drew this Mona Lisa. And you, you know, drew, drew a dog that looks like a cow. So you get, a, you get a C. Well, that's not fair. Maybe this one spent twice as long doing it, but their ability just wasn't there. See, the Lord doesn't work that way. The Lord doesn't work like that. He, he looks to see, did you do your best according to your ability? See, you, I may not be called to reach the entire globe for Jesus Christ, but, but the group that He's called me to reach, I need to do my best to reach that group. He may not be calling you to win everybody in your neighborhood. He might just be calling you to reach your neighbor or the one across the street or someone down the road. Whoever. It's a co-worker, a friend. If you do that, see, the person who's called to reach a thousand people, so let's say they only reach 500 of those. This person's called to reach 10 people and they reach all 10. Who is more successful? Oh, well, this one's more successful because they got 500 saved. And this one only got 10 people saved. That's not how the Lord looks at it. The Lord looks at it according to your own ability. The Lord looks at it and says, you got half the job done. You got the whole job done. That's the way the Lord looks. So we don't have to compare ourselves and worry about that. We just do the best we can do. I coached a lot of sports with my kids growing up, and I never, ever, ever got angry with a player if they did their best. Never. I mean, it was hard for me to get angry at a, at a child for striking out. Why, why? I see coaches all the time screaming and yelling at kids for striking out. And I think, that coach is a dummy. Do you really think that kid wanted to strike out? No, that kid wanted to hit the ball. That kid wanted to hit a home run. That kid wanted to get on base. And you're just making it worse by yelling at them for doing something that they didn't want to do. They tried their best. They tried to hit the ball. Now, if they're not listening to you, you know, they're swinging with their eyes closed or something, that's a different story. But if they're given their best ability, how can you get mad at that? How can you be upset at that? If they're doing what they were told to do and doing the best at it. Colossians 3.23 says this, And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. See, that's all you got to keep in mind. Is whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it for Jesus. Amen. I think I think about this. You, you, you're kind of in a special spot right there because <clears throat> I don't know why I do this, but but a lot of times before I get ready to preach, I just envision Jesus sitting right there on the front row in this first chair. Because really, he's the one that needs to be impressed with what I say today. He's the one who's who's got to give me the nod and the amen, and that's right. That's what I want you to say. All right, now you can shut up. <laughs> that's enough. Don't say too much. Amen. The, the, the first three points were good, but the 40th and 41st point began to drag on a little bit. That's really what we do. We're doing for the Lord. And that's what he said later on in this chapter. If you did it unto the least of these, it was like you were doing it for me. So we just do it the best that we're, we, we can do. Whatever it is that we're doing, we just give our effort at it. We don't do it halfway. We don't give the Lord our leftovers. We don't give Him second best. We do it for the Lord. 
So here's, here's how to hear those words, well done. You are a child of God. You say, I want to hear well done. But not everybody's going to hear well done. As we saw in this story, at least a third in this story heard wicked and lazy instead of well done. Find something to do for the Lord. Find something to do for the Lord. Find something to do. Do it the best you can for Him. Whatever, however that you know entails. Do it till He comes. Just keep doing it. Just do the best you can for the Lord and do it till He comes. And you will hear those words that we all want to hear. Well done. You did a good job. I'm proud of you. 